Hello everybody, I hope you're all enjoying your lockdown experience. What a crazy time it is we're all going through. Today's video is a big conversation between myself and Mr. Oliver Jack Jones. You guys know him, you love him, you've seen him in lots of the videos over the years. Um, he was there from the very start of Tool Order and Oliver and I have been through a lot together. We've traveled the world. We've had good times, we've had bad times. And today we share lots of stories about riding BMX, about running, fitness, alcoholism, smoking weed, girls, business, uh, the best riders in the world. We chatted about all sorts. I can't quite remember, but it's a really good conversation. And we're just trying to put out some content during these crazy times for you guys, because obviously we can't get out and ride. Um, the podcast is also available to listen to on the podcast app. So if you search Sebastian Keep, you can listen to it without the visuals. And yeah, it's, it's, it was a good, good fun experience to chat to Ollie and record it for you guys. Um, I'll probably do another one of these uh, with someone else in the future. So keep your eye out for that. And as always, thank you so much for listening and in watching and following the journey because uh, it's not going to stop anytime soon. I'll stop waffling. Thank you, guys. Enjoy. That's all right. Yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah, we're live. Mr. What's Jones, happening? how is the lockdown affecting your life? Has it changed it dramatically? Yeah, I am, I am no longer waking up at 5 a.m. to go to the gym. I'm no longer going to work. It has changed completely. Basically, what's happened now is my life has gone back to when I had a year off working, but now I'm getting paid. That's what's happened. This is the thing. I, I think that's why BMX sales are a little bit up is because people are at home, they're getting paid, they can't go to the pub to spend their money, they can't go to restaurants to spend their money, they can't go to festivals to spend their money. So I think people have got like disposable income a little bit more. I totally agree with you. I think the shock was what first happened. Everyone was like, oh my God, we've got no money, we're going to lose our jobs. And now it's kind of all like relaxed now and everyone knows what's happening so everyone knows that they're going to get 80 percent of their wages for doing nothing you can no longer spend like five or a day on coffee and snacks so you're say you're saving like 400 pound a month probably so all that extra cash that you now have is going like you're like oh i can go online shopping like i'm one for that i've just bought a new pair of sunglasses because i was like well I've got nothing to spend it on so some I really need to buy some sunglasses, but because I'm old and I don't really know anything about fashion, I don't know which ones to get. Can you like help me <laughs> buy some sunglasses? Well, I just bought. I buy speedy ones because, in my opinion, I think speedy boys are coming back in this season. So, like, I've got, I've got a pair of Oakley radars, and they're sick. They're like red and blue lenses, and they're like wrapped around your face, make you look really quick. So, I recommend them. I don't like Oakleys. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> I know. I just I. Well, for, for a start, I'm going to lose them. I lose sunglasses every time I buy them. So I just need some. I might just go in Tesco and buy some. No, don't do Tesco. Just get ASOS. Go on ASOS or something. Don't go Tesco. Okay, well, that's that's enough for me. You give me information, I'll go to ASOS. What about your workout routine? So you're, so basically, you're going to be absolutely ripped by the end of it. And I'm going to be the same old soft me because I'm making porridge for my son instead of doing press-ups <laughs> in the morning. <laughs> Oh, um, my routine, well, I'm still trying to keep a regular routine. I'm getting up at, um, like, 6.30, trying to eat and then train. But it's got to the point now where I'm just doing stupid, stupid workouts for the sake of it. Like, yesterday I did uh, with my 10 kilo weight vest, mile run, 1,000 burpees, and then a mile run again. It just gets to the point where it's like, how stupid can you be because you have the time on your hands? Do you know what I mean? But um, I, I'm enjoying having all the free time. I have to train, like, three times a day. And that's always good. I, I literally look at you guys and my younger friends who don't have babies and relationships, and I'm, I just envy you because I'm like, like I said, I'm in the morning. And my my routine hasn't changed. I wake up at six, get my son out of bed, make him porridge. We really wish that I could work out, but I do actually. It's not that I don't absolutely love being with him. The mornings are special, but I do look at you lot and think enjoy this time because it's like when you're back at work in the grind and you're hating life again you look back on this and be like that was so nice yeah i i, I agree with you like when i'm not working like split shifts like 10 to 10 i'm gonna be like man when i was getting up at six had the whole day to do stuff that was sick but haven't you um didn't red bull send you something in the post to get fit oh yeah <laughs> 
Yeah, there's like two ways to take that, isn't there? Like, <laughs> Thanks a lot, but I'm not actually obese. But yeah, they sent me a Watt bike and it's actually amazing. It's like really, really, really fun to go on and it's so convenient. You know how like working out at the gym's fun, but you still got to almost like you got to worry about your appearance. But the other day on the Watt bike, I was in my slippers and my pajamas <laughs> sweating. I was like, probably should have taken my pajamas off. <laughs> but yeah, it's sick though. It's um, it's nice that Red Bull think about our health a little bit because they don't need to do that. They sent me a Watt bike, and I was, and it's like an expensive bike too. I think it's about three thousand pounds worth. Jesus, it's so nice. So I go for a run in the morning, and then I'll get on that for 10, 15 minutes, and it just, you know, just you sweat it. There's something about exercising and sweating for me. It's like more satisfying. Oh, I know. I totally agree. If you hit a workout and you are like literally just like sweat dripping off you, it feels good. That's what you don't get when you go for a bike ride because the wind sort of cools you off and dries you off. Yeah, I find cycling makes me cold. Like even now, I'm going out on my road bike and doing like sixty miles, but like, I'm like I've got uh a, like I wear like a compression t-shirt and then like my jersey over top, and then I still get cold because I don't know. You just I, I think we we're just used to moving more, and the wind just chills me down. I can't handle the cold. I'm not good with the cold. Yeah, and you imagine if you did sixty miles in your top bedroom <laughs> while the heating's on. That's what I'm roasting. Doing. Yeah, because you you're set up. It's on the top of your. It's on your on your top floor, isn't it? Looking out yeah. the window, looks sick. You you post a picture of it on um. There's a gold now, and it looked well done. I was like, oh, I was like, that looks mad. Yeah, that's when the sun sets. I, Red Bull asked me to shoot a photo of it the other day because they did. I did like this interview for um. I think one of the papers, the Independent or something, talking about my workout routine. I was like quickly better make a workout routine, you did, so don't you, have a routine. You did one. <laughs> yeah <laughs> well they were asking about lockdown and like i did little, that little video in my garden of like bmx tricks you can do at home and stuff so they're asking about that and i was like they're like so how do you do a bunny hop i was like ah so i was like explaining how to do a bunny hop over the phone to some reporter and it was just it was weird but it was I, good. I enjoyed that video of you doing tricks in my garden i my favorite was the 360 just because I knew, I knew <laughs> do you know what i did that and i thought about ollie i was like he's gonna be taking the piss out of me for this i just like you basically three hopped over the kicker and i was like this is so bad it was so hard to do a 360 out of that with that run up i honestly i couldn't i could only like a 360 i'd rather 360 on the floor than out that kicker so hard. i know i know but that most people would but i've got no muscular strength for the moment so <laughs> i've not been riding so i needed a kicker it was good i enjoyed it so for running, do you still get like what you always got out of running? Because like when we first started running, we started running together at the same time, didn't we? Yeah. Like we'd never run before, and I started running. And I was like, Ollie, you got to do running, man. It's so it's really sick and makes you feel amazing. So you got straight into it, and your level just went way past mine instantly because you just needed more from it. Yeah, I think with any sport that I do, I get really. Um, sucked into just trying to like push myself and be better and better every day do you know what I mean like, I've got quite a, a personality where I just want I not want to be the best but I want to see how good I can be at whatever I'm doing so when I started running like we were doing it I really I just I was like oh this is fun I'm actually kind of enjoying this this is sick and then just started building up building up and just yeah I don't know I just, it was just that's what I like but um yeah I still sometimes like it sucks. Do you know what I mean? You go out for a run and you're like, my legs are heavy. Everything's like, oh, this is really tiring. I just, it, then like those are the runs you have to like push yourself through. But sometimes I go out and I just, I don't even like track how fast I'm running or I track, I won't even track like how far I'm going. I just run for the feeling of running. And sometimes when you just, when you take it back to like from away from like training as such and take it back to like just going out to the enjoyment of the exercise it just gives you so much more like you come back feeling like elated. I can't, I can't change you. Like if I put, I put music in and I'll just put on like an album I really like. It's like just upbeat and fun and I won't try and push anything. I just run for the fun of it and it just makes me feel, I can't explain the feeling. It's so good. Oh yeah. Everyone knows about the runner's high, but that's what I got th from it was my, well, I'd wake up in the morning and my head's like a Rubik's cube all jumbled up and I go for a run and after about two miles, everything starts to become clear in my head and all my thoughts and ideas just come to life. And it's like, yeah, it's just like, it's like the Rubik's cube gets made and I'm suddenly able to have so much more clarity of my day. And I get back, have a shower and I'm just like, 
I feel so good for the day now. Like the anxiety of mm. wanting to get stuff done straight away in the morning's gone because you've burnt some energy. And yeah, once you st- discover running, it's like so hard to to walk away from that addiction. Like I, I, and this is another thing that me and you always talk about is pe- so many people will say, I can't run. I can't run. It's too hard. My, my thing is, everyone can run because you don't have to go fast just 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 put your phone on and set the timer to two minutes and run two minutes then run two minutes back you've run four minutes Mm. do it five minutes run five minutes back you've run 10 minutes it's just you you just got to get out there and try and it's so easy because you just go slow that's what i say like like now's the best time everyone's starting to run now like the 5k challenge every every, people are i'm gonna start running now it's perfect the people that say they can't run but i always explain to them because like Human beings run on their back legs to save energy to hunt bigger prey. We are designed to run over long distances to hunt prey. So people are like, oh, I'm not designed for running. No, you are. The human body is designed to run. So I was like, so there's no excuses there. You just don't like feeling out of breath. And that is because you're running too fast. If yeah. you don't, I was like, if you haven't got to run fast, I was like, you just move at the pace you want to move at and enjoy yeah. it. And then one, I think once you try and tell people they haven't got to just go out there and run a marathon, they're like, oh, actually, it's kind of fun. I kind of enjoy this. But like, I think uh, what puts people off is people walk up the stairs in their house and they're like, oh, I'm so out of breath. There's no way I could run. Mm-hmm. But I'm, a, I'm out of breath walking up the stairs in my house. You, it's just when you run, you find that pace where you can be slightly out of breath, but you control your breathing and then you're comfortable and you can go at that pace for a lot further than you, you realize. Oh, I totally agree with you. I just, yeah, I, I, I try and get everyone involved in running as much as I can. Well, I, I do running coaching now. I help people out with running. I'm coaching a few people. So... I just I just enjoy watching people get out of running. What I get out of running, like even if they if they just want to run just and have a better form and not hurt themselves or like not injure themselves. They're like, oh my knee hurts. I'm like, oh, you're probably running like this. Let's just do this. Or if people are trying to like people want a faster five k, faster ten k time. Like, yeah, I just enjoy helping someone get to the goal they want to get to. Yeah, and it's so satisfying because you know that once someone gets into running, that is it. They're going to absolutely love it. And it's the best way to lose weight. It's the best. It's, it's really good for your anxiety if you suffer from that. And it just helps out with so many things in your life if you get get, get out and go for a run in the morning. Oh, I think it, the mental side of running is, is probably one of the reasons that I got into it because I, I suffer quite a bit. Not like suffer quite a bit, but I do suffer with like depression. And like I find that having something to focus on or just the exercise and getting out running it always helped me to deal with that like if I was having a bad day or I don't know what it is it just you can get out there and and I think it's you could even set a goal for yourself with running and it doesn't matter about anything else you can just get out there and do it if you're like I'm going to go for a run once you've finished that goal okay I've done a goal like that's that's so completed today but that helps I I feel that helps to ease depression because I suffered quite I think it was when I was in with you, I suffered quite badly for it. And then I just, I, I don't know, I just use running as like my coping mechanism, mechanism with it. So I just don't think that's helped me massively. Well, I use exercise as a coping mechanism anyway, but I think running but, helps a lot. Well, that's the thing. With, um, like you said earlier, that you wanted to be, you, you try and be the very best at everything you do. The thing I thought was interesting about you is with BMX, you weren't like, you're not like that. BMX, you're just, you don't care. You go out there and have fun. It's not like, you're not trying to be the best but when you got into running I was so surprised because I would run two three miles around the park in the morning but then you would be like running 10 miles every single day like within a couple of months I started riding and I was like Ollie like what, what, why are you doing this and you said like, I just love it I absolutely love it and I was like coming back we were meeting for coffee in the mornings after our runs and I'd be like yeah I did three miles and you'd be like yeah I do the same route 10 miles every day and then obviously you well for the person listening to this ollie ended up after probably running for what a few months i think i think no i think i ran i think it was six months and i did a half marathon and then it was like 10 months i did the ultra right and so ollie ran an ultra marathon which is 65 miles he'd never even run a marathon he said to me i'm going to run an ultra marathon i was like ollie that's like running from Brighton to London, Hastings to London, six over sixty miles, sixty five miles. Like I don't know if, if if any of you guys listening to this have ever run before. I personally max out at like ten miles. I can't go any further. And my body's just I just can't do it. And you like like you say that you wanted to be the best at running. 
and you really were but with BMX you took as a joke but with running you're really good like you're much better than me like by a long shot it's crazy I think it's because I was never like when I first started BMX I was never super good at it It, like I I don't know I don't don't, if it's skill based I find it hard to be like learn I don't know it's something about learning skills I'm not super good at learning skills so I just like use BMX like having fun with my mates, hanging out. Like if I, if I can do some good tricks, I enjoy it. Like I'll, st- I'll still push myself and try and learn tricks, but I use BMX more like a hanging out thing because like all my friends did it, and uh, I still get that kind of enjoyment of bantering. Yeah. But what, but you I, enjoy the pain, don't you, of running? You yeah. enjoy that. What I, what I liked about running is, and it's thanks to that book you put me onto, Bounce by um, Matthew Syed, the myth of talent and the power of practice. It's like the only the only deep difference between you getting good at running is how much you run. Like, that's all it is. There's, there's no, like, you have to learn something. It's like, if you want to get faster, you have to run faster. If you want to run further, you have to run further. It's not like you have to learn a special skill. It's just all you have to do is move your legs more. And you Keep already, going, yeah. yeah. Yeah, work at it, yeah. And I think that's just, I just enjoyed the fact that, like, I'm, like, I'm always quite mentally strong when it comes to, like, suffering. So, like, I don't mind putting my, myself through pain because... I don't know, like with running, it's like you, the pain's going to finish. So it feels, you, to, feels to me like it's an escape for you because I know that you you do get depressed and I can see it in you sometimes. I've spent a lot of time with you. I've lived with you and I can see you suffer sometimes, but it, see, it seems like it just takes you away from it all. Yeah, I, re- I really think like... It does, doesn't it? Running yeah. just takes you to that place where you're just breathing and just out in nature. Yeah, like long distance running, you can literally run for like two, three hours and just not... there's You don't worry about anything other than what is going on in front of you and you can think about things you can reassess life choices you can and it's just and when it gets tough and you're like you're pushing through pain like this really hurts it's like well yeah suck it up let's go like it's not mm. you, you have to deal with it like outside your comfort zone is where you grow so that's yeah good. no i agree some people just get that in different things i i i personally like running but i don't like pushing it too much but anyway you um also you're I think you part of the reason you ran the 65 miles was because you're you were trying to raise money right for a cancer tra- uh, charity uh, yeah there was a hospice in um uh that i wanted to raise money for basically my cousin he was like i think i ran it when i was 25 and he was he was 25 and he got skin cancer got rid of it and then it came back and he actually sadly passed away from it and that kind of hit me pretty hard you know like i was like this kind of two three years younger than him and just you like you think you're fit and healthy your whole life Eddie, and then all of a sudden like it snap you're done there's nothing and it just kind of i was like wow everything can change in like a moment and then i want to raise money so i'm going to do something that i want to do so i just thought well what can i do that's fairly impressive that what might get some money so i'll run an ultra marathon and i was like i'd literally just run i think the most run was a 10k when i decided it and yeah i just thought well you only get one life and you might as well try and do what you can for it so i thought if i can raise some money to help out after that that'd be good i think it came out of you know for like young people we all live in this not i'm not young anymore but when we're young we all live in the in this sort of reality where you think i'm indestructible i can go out drinking every weekend i can ride I can do all the you know i can go to bed late and then you hear of these stories of people passing away at a young age. And, and then I think it gets gets to a point maybe in your mid twenties to l- late twenties where you realize that you need to actually look after yourself a little bit to somewhat because you, you know, you, you're not indestructible. And if it felt like you, you, you know, you definitely had your fun when you were younger, your party <laughs> times and stuff, but it feels like that's, that's you, you hit that realization in your mid twenties to like stop all that. Yeah, I just, I, there's, a, there's a defining moment that kind of like made me do this. I, I think you had just started running, I think maybe for like two, three weeks. And it was like one of the normal weekends where we got like me and Lacey and Jordan, everyone had been out partying all night in Hastings. And I remember waking up underneath our coffee table in the lounge. And I was like, <laughs> it was like, it was like a click in my head. And I was like, man, you, you need to not do this anymore. You just sort yourself out. And it was like, it was like, like a snap in my brain and I was like yeah that's it I'm, I'm kind of like cutting this back getting onto like straight and narrow <laughs> I never understood why when when you go out drinking 
you're, you're, you'll be absolutely paralytic. You make it all the way back to your house, but then you'll like fall asleep in your front room and not make it to bed. <laughs> like, I don't understand that. <laughs> There's so many times that I've just been, I've like, woken up on the floor and I'm like, what is going on? The, cra- the interesting thing that you say, like you'd only ever run a small distance and then you were taken on this massive 65 mile run is that was at the same time when I was doing my walls project and I had this huge gap in mind but I was only practicing these little gaps in the warehouse it felt like we were both we both had this ridiculous almost unobtainable goal in mind and we were almost working on it together we were living together running every morning together it was, it was a good time I really I loved that time I was one of the best years of my life days um what, but what I think was like the same when we were both working on it is like you were doing the gap in the warehouse and every day or whatever you would like do like a, you would like bring it back a little bit or you'd work on like bite sized chunks you weren't just trying to jump straight into it and I think it comes back to like um I think we're both good at this like breaking stuff down into manageable little goals that you can complete to one big goal like I didn't just go I'm going to run 65 miles and run it I was like right okay let's do it so every day I'd slowly build up my like my daily mileage. So I'd go from running like four miles to six to eight. So I'd do five days a week, I would run eight miles and then I'd have a rest day. And then on the Sunday I'd run like 17 and then I'd build up slowly and slowly. So you're, you're slowly building up tiny little chunks until you can actually reach your goal. Like you were slowly building up to those jumps. So you, you can't just jump into it full like without. I'm so, I'm so interested in that at the moment. Like the fact that, literally anyone can learn a really difficult skill if you break it down and you and you're patient and you take it very in tiny small steps that's what um the apprentice style is isn't it like mm. you give you 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 you've got a re- very skilled worker in, in the room and an apprentice and he's looking at the skilled workers like there's no way i can do that mm. but then the apprentice gives them the sweeping up job and he sweeps up he's like oh, does that for a few days so bored of it and then he gives them the next level up and before the before the apprentice knows it he's doing the skilled work you know yeah. over sort of because he's he's got bored of the each step but he's done each step so gradually and that yeah like i always say that in bmx i think people look at bmx and they see all these really hard tricks and it's so unobtainable because they think that someone's learned that in a day mm. but bmx is so you learn the tiniest steps every day every time you ride you learn something new yeah it's it bmx is the prime example you don't just you don't just roll in and like quad whip a box like you've got to learn to roll in first you've got to learn to jump the box first you'll do like and I, yeah i think i think people just kind of go oh no there's no i'm not gonna go that's too hard or oh, i'm gonna look silly i can't do that but everyone's got to start somewhere like mm. nobody starts being an expert at anything like you literally have to start at the bottom or work at the top. There's no way about it. Yeah, the good thing about BMX is you enjoy those steps. You enjoy um, every every little bit of it, from like dropping in on a ramp to you know the next step to learning the first tricks. And I tell you what, I went for a valuable lesson when I started the business. Of of of, I was very impatient before I started the business, but it's taught me patience. Yeah, you learning were very that, impatient. Yeah, you can't have everything you want at once like a business takes is like small drops in a bucket every day before it starts to grow and it's like you just have to every day try and get a few things done and realize it's not all going to happen in a day just focus on the goals that you're doing every single day and don't think about the big picture yeah i think that's i think that is one of the best ways to look at anything and that's going back to running like and like it's just a metaphor for life like when things get tough like when life gets tough, you've got to think about little goals. Like when the run gets tough, like every single step is a little win. As long as you're moving yeah. forward, one step is a little goal you're completing. And that, as long as you think like one step, that's fine, that's fine. It's like in life, ah, oh, today sucks, can't this. Like, well done, you've got to be out of shower today. Well done, that's one step. Well done, you like, you got yeah. out of the house. Like that's, and I think it's quite easy to forget in this day and age when everyone's like, oh, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. Look at me on Instagram, but everyone forgets the little steps make those things and they just show the final they try and show the final picture yeah totally like like when you're running five miles i it's a mental battle sometimes i'll be running the first mile and i'll be thinking i have got so far to go and i'll start built thinking about the mountain that i've got to climb and it drives me crazy but if i just think all right just enjoy the moment take each step at a time breathe like like you said, it's a metaphor for everything you do in life. You can't learn it all in a day. Yeah. 
that's what I think anyway. Interesting stuff. Um, so you, it's interesting to me because when I hang around with you, the way you are with drinking, the way I'm, I am with drinking is totally different. Like you definitely have a much more addictive personality than me, don't you? Yeah, I've definitely, I would definitely say I've got, my personality is very addictive. Definitely got a slight problem with, like with drinking. I've definitely got a slight problem with drinking. Well, like when I drink, I've got a problem. When I don't, I haven't. If you know what I mean? Like I, yeah. I can, it will get to the point where I can, like, I can have like one or two beers, like once or twice, I'll be fine. But as soon as I start getting a taste for like drinking all the time, like, I'll be drinking like every day. And then I just, it then it spirals down to depression. But yeah, I, 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 I can not drink for a long period of time. And then as soon as I start like heavily drinking, that's like, it's just a slippery slope for me. And I'm just like drinking, smashing beers all the time. So I'm, like, it's just, I mean, you see, you see me, like I can be like straight edge, not drinking, like focus, like, focus. And then as soon as I start, having one or two and it, it like just it's just like it's like it's like a, a seesaw and it'd be fine it'd be fine it'd all be bad it's like ding, ding, little drops and it'll just be like do, 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 slip. that's my my whole thing is you should try your very best to never be dependent on anything so say for example i heard the other day someone saying that they drink or smoke weed when they're feeling down and i thought that's so weird this this was someone that is totally got their life together but they said when i feel a little bit depressed they just have a little drink or smoke weed and i was like that's so weird because for me it's the opposite like i only like to have a drink or have go out with my friends if i'm in a good mood i've had a, have, if i've had a good day mm. i can't ever drink if i'm feeling low and i think that's why i'm i've never had any tendencies or predisposition to be reliant or dependent on any substance like i i, I enjoy going out with my friends but like we've been on trips where if if you could look at our group like we've seen you drink in the daytime and it's like you know like we, we all joke about it and you know yeah. like you know that you you're you you've got that predisposition to potentially be an alcoholic which is, yeah. is scary but we always joke about it but I, i'm not i'm not like that no you, i've always seen like I, I can i would like drink in the day and like not like from nine in the morning it'd be like three in the afternoon but you you're quite easy but like, no nah, i'm fine with that like then if i'm already drinking it's just yeah i'm i think i'm the same i though when it's like your friend when i'm depressed it's just a slippery slope for me i'll just drink and it's just it messes with your head like i think i just came off like four days ago um i was like doing fine with training coping with like lockdown and stuff and i just like I started having a few drinks and then it just escalated to like four days of just like constant drinking. And I just didn't feel myself, just just depressed, like didn't know how to cope with anything. And like had to be like, right, snap out of it. You're, you're being yeah. an idiot. But like, Drinking's so terribly bad for Honestly, you, I think I, I, it's one of the worst, one of the worst like drugs that I've, I've ever been across. 100%, 100%. Because it's, it, the worst thing is it's, you can go to the shop and spend five pounds and get three massive bottles of beer. That's going to put pretty much put you like blackout comatose. Whereas like, do you know what I mean? Like you guys like go and hunt down on the drugs. This is like, you can go to the corner shop and people, people think you're normal for going to buy like three beers. They're like, Oh, that's fine. Just buying three massive beers. I'm buying a liter and a half of like poison for my body. And think what, think what a bottle of vodka would do to a grown man, but you can buy that in a shop. Yeah. You, it would put you on your back. <laughs> an 18 year old boy, like a boy can go into the shop and just buy it and just smash it if he wants. And it's, I, I do think that there's not enough being done. I think well, obviously the government's trying, there's not enough to be done to show that actually how bad alcohol is for your health and for your mental health. And I just think there needs to be a massive change up in stuff that like the whole kind of, situation with it because it's so easy so i see people now at my age who are literally alcoholics they're drinking yeah. they're like, and I, I was one of them well I, 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 I can be one i think people don't understand how much they're drinking no. i mean people are drinking like every day or maybe even if you're binge drinking every saturday if you're drinking every saturday and you're, you're going out you're a partial alcoholic yeah. like it's crazy i don't think people understand how bad it is no it's funny, like when we've gone on trips in the past, like sometimes I can see 
Because it's easy when you're on a road trip and you're with all your friends, you do you do want to have a drink and enjoy yourself, and that's when I've seen you spiral because you have a drink in the night and then the next day you wake up in the morning you're like, is it too early to drink? And then we all laugh <laughs> yes. and you go, you won't, and then it's ten in the morning you're drinking a beer and we're all filming it and laughing, and then three days later you're starting a fight with us in the <laughs> restaurant like you did in Florida. <laughs> right. But yeah, good times. Um, yeah, I, just yeah I, I, I think, I think, like I said earlier, I think it's important not, to, and this, this is the funny thing, right? Whatever you do, whatever it is that makes you happy, you should try your very hardest not to be dependent on that as the only thing that makes you happy. Yeah. I think if, I think if you're depressed and the only thing that makes you happy is to exercise, but then you get addicted to exercise, you've got to be careful because you've got to learn to embrace those feelings of sadness and, and ride them like a wave and learn your, about your own emotions, learn how to be yourself and then, and then, and then learn to deal with it in, in, in certain ways like running or, you know, stuff like this. This is, I tell you what, uh, I'm rambling a bit here, but my thing with drinking and then people that smoke weed is like, uh, often people that smoke weed smoke, all day every day yeah. and it's like you don't know who you are when you're not stoned you only know yourself as being high do you know like I've, I've known people in the past that they're never not high they're always high yeah and i i totally agree and it's like and when then they're just high the whole time when when you're not high when you start worrying about you're like oh well, what, what is this feeling i don't know like i don't know how to deal with this feeling so you go and get high again yeah but i think that's the problem with Another problem like, with weed smoking is it it's not socially acceptable to be stoned all the time. And just, yeah. and it's like so like, it's not socially acceptable to be drunk all the time. But yeah. like for some reason we're okay with maybe because we're like we see cigarettes and it's kind of that kind of thing. It's just if you're just smoking. But for some reason it's just like, Oh yeah, you're just stoned and you're like that's not cool. Like if I was if I if I was paralytic the whole time, you'd be like, Yeah, we need to get him to get like see somebody he cooked yeah that's that's exactly right isn't it like if you were drinking a vodka red bull at 10 in the morning your friend's gonna be like dude like what's up with you but for some reason we've let it we, we, we it's socially okay what's well, not okay for me but like yeah, yeah everyone's smoking weed in the mornings I, I i just just put this out there i have i do not care what people do everyone's free to do whatever they want but i think for your own sanity if you smoke weed every single day all day i think you should really try and have a break at least from it and, and just go back to square one find out who you are without it i i agree you, you can do whatever you like I, I, I people do what they want i don't care it's not it's not to me but yeah i just think because you see on instagram you'll see someone post yeah like a joint and be like wake and bake and you're like if i was posting a picture of beer being like <laughs> wake and let's get smashed you'd be like ollie are you okay do you know what i mean you wouldn't but like it's so it's, it's like seen as a norm so i'm like oh, I'm, just, I'm just waking and baking man just getting 420 already in the morning you're like, but you're not you're not going to question that person which i think we should yeah. we should well i think i think the people that smoke weed are like yeah it's it's it, it's a plant it's fine it grows out the ground and it, and it, and, it, and it opens up your creativity i agree i think it's quite a good substance but i don't agree with smoking it all day every day especially nine in the morning like smoke it on a Saturday evening or a, a social situation, but if you're smoking it all day, every day, and you're dependent on it and you can't go without it, you have a problem. 100%. But going back to what you said, like you need to manifest your own happiness. And I, I've read like, a lot of books about the psychology of it and how, how to like, you need to be happy with yourself and just yourself, not using any of the coping mechanisms and just, and you should feel the feelings you're feeling so you can actually like deal with them. 100%. I, I learned that when I was, when I had my, one of my first ever breakups with a girl, I was, you know, I think everyone has ever had a breakup knows that feeling. I was like, oh my God, this is, it hurt. I was depressed. I couldn't think about anything else. And I learned, yeah, I learned how to ride it out and deal with my emotions. And I came out the other end so hyped. Yeah. I totally agree with you. You were there for my, I think you were there for my first real breakup. <laughs> I've been there for a few of your breakups. Which, which one was it? it was, I think it was Fennel. Fennel, Fennel was first, wasn't it? It was. It was that one was first, and then there was. Oh, there was the other one. The other one. The other yeah. one. <laughs> the saga. The saga. The, the trilogy. The never-ending saga. That was good. Wow, I killed Hastings. That was a great place. That's to still do. not over. That saga's potentially I'm, still. 
still running. It's like it's like Game of Thrones, the last book still being written. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I enjoy that saga. I mean, I totally enjoy that saga as well. There's, you never know what's going to happen. I think everyone can relate to their friends getting a girlfriend, kind of disappearing, then coming back and spitting up with them. And then you, you sort of put your arm around the shoulder. Then they go back to the girl and you're like, dude, I told you not to go back there. No, she's different. She's changed. It's going to work. You went, I love her. You, you both went on a break. You both slept with someone else. It is never, ever going to work ever again. Yeah. And you're like, no. No, but I love her. No, but you don't understand. This is different. It's not different. <laughs> Everyone's done it. You're mental. She's mental. Leave it. Yeah, you have all those destructive relationships when you're in your early 20s and you think that, like, you've got to cling on to them. And, you know, where are, where are those girls that I was so in love with in my early 20s? I'm not with them now. I've got a baby with someone else. It's like, just learn to realise that there's there's more to life. I mean, well, I'm still having destructive relationships in my late 20s, so. You are very destructive. Yay, me. <laughs> I do love your life, Ollie. I feel like sometimes, like I tell, I think I tell myself I don't like drama, but then I, I end up in a absolute melting pot of drama most of the time. I think men do like it to a certain degree. That whole the the ferocious chicks. It's big. It comes back to that the, the graph, isn't it? It's, it's the graph. It's like it's like the hot crazy scale. It's like the hotter they are, the crazier they are. It's like a, like a line. It's like. I mean, there's a there's a video and it's crazy and it's yeah but that's not entirely fair because you're crazy too aren't you like we're all a little bit crazy it's not well, all I, girls i am absolutely mental absolutely cooked. i am absolutely fried <laughs> that's the interesting thing i learned when i started the, the the tall order business is i because i was starting with nothing i couldn't afford to sponsor established pros that were good at what they do were good at traveling good at traveling the world could handle being in the van with other guys so i sponsored you <laughs> and little tommy g and a, a few of the guys and and with all, all with all due respect you guys haven't gone through the the sort of steps to becoming a professional the road trips and the and the learning the way so i was taking you straight on onto the road trips and you weren't that good at it. You're not that good. You didn't travel very well. I can travel and for five days before I start hating people. Not five days anymore. It's shrunk. It's shrunk to about a day and a half. Just, all right. I think a lot of people can relate to this. I have like a social switch in my head. Like this is why, this is why I don't drink when I'm at home with my friends. Like if we all go out, like go out to our bar or something, I won't drink, I'll drive. Because then as soon as I'm done with social interaction, as soon as I'm like, I'm like, yeah, that's me. I, I don't want to talk to you anymore. I can just drive home because it happens. Yeah. It happens to me. I can be stood there. And she goes, and I'm like, no, nah, I don't, I don't want to talk to anyone. I don't want to be hanging out. I want to be at home by myself. And yeah. I think everyone gets that. And I just think the older you get, the less time you have to spend listening to someone spear off rubbish. And you're just like, I don't believe anything you're saying. I'm going home now. But that's why, um, being a professional at something especially bmx is much more than riding you've got to learn to be able to handle those interactions you've got to go out with your team manager for dinner you've got to shake hands with the kooky kid that you you know <laughs> that does the tricks that you're not really keen on you've got you've 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 got to be social and you've got to be around those social situations and there's uh, so much more to just being good on a bike or or marketing your brand you've you've got to be able to travel you've got to be able to go to the party but make the airport the next day you've got to be able to pack your bike away you've got to not lose your bike the second you la you get to florida <laughs> oh, tommy g getting the bike stolen and do, 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 i don't think everyone knows about this story basically what happened was our, it was our first day in florida um i think bone had just got there real late so like and then we were like all, we were all in the house and then matty Kramer, matt peter and Tommy G will like buzz in to go ride, and they're like, "Let's go, Laura, ride around. Let's go do some bunny hops over speed bumps." And then me, and sixteen years old, first international trip. And then me, was it me and you were like, "Oh, well, let's go get a coffee. Let's take the car because we can't be asked." Um, and then we, we took the car to the coffee to, to, to a, a petrol station to get a coffee. They rode there, and for some reason, like they forgot the rule of someone stays outside with the bike, and they all three went in, and then. <laughs> We just turn around and just see Tommy G, Tommy G's bike. So, did we watch it get nicked or did you just come outside and not find it? 
they just came outside and the bike was gone. And then, and then <laughs> we we it was the first morning in Florida. They came back to the house. <laughs> Bo, Bowen's asleep. We told Bowen, and he's obviously a veteran, been to Florida so many times. And the first thing he said was just he just opened one eye and just went, "Welcome to Orlando." <laughs> It was perfect, wasn't and Corey it? Corey Bowen is honestly one of the greatest men I know. But that's that's a prime example of, you know, someone that's not professional being in a in a situation where they're on a pay trip to another country. They've, you know, you, your, your job, you're really the, you're there to market the brand. And you, I always think of someone like Corey Martinez, and I think of that. He's just if you, if you sponsor Corey Martinez, you fly him to another country to get a job done. He will get the job done. He will get there with his bike. He won't get his bike stuck. Do you yeah. know what I'm saying? He, like he, he's just he, professional. He's not gonna he's not gonna become an alcoholic on the trip. <laughs> he is a straight. He is like the epitome of BMX. He hasn't aged since I've ever since I watched Drop the Hammer. If anything, he's got younger. So in like 20 years, he's literally degressed in age. He now looks 17, but he just he is incredible. His I love. His riding, I really do. He, he does everything. He it's not like he just does one thing. He he can literally ride everything. What I love about Corey is he always rides the sickest spots, but then he'll do the most creative, sickest trick that everyone wants to be able to do on that spot. Yeah, I agree. When like his first video part, well, not his first, but his one in the square one video and the can I eat video, like I used to just literally try and copy them. <laughs> I was like, you are. You are phenomenal, and like, 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 like I'm saying, he's still going. He's still out there being a professional. But he, the thing is, he's still out there, still going, and he's still at the top of his game. He's still like out there with all the new kids, being like, "Nah, that's what you want to do." Yeah, I respect that. Awesome dude, absolutely, absolute legend. Love him. But yeah, so that's a good, good topic actually. Who's who's your favorite rider? I don't know who my favorite rider is now, but I remember my favorite rider when I was younger. And that was Robin Fenlon. <laughs> he was literally my favourite rider. I even bought stripy jumpers to be like him. And I would go out and I would try tail whips because he could do tail pops. And I would like, I yeah, I thought he was the absolute don. It's because I watched Roundabout. I would say I've probably watched Roundabout more times than I've than I've probably woken up. Like I would watch it twice, three times a day. Like when I was rock, like, <sighs> yeah. So because I watched that, and he was like. He he rode stuff that we rode at my skate park, and I was like, I just want to be him. He's sick. He had that sort of natural, influential nature that he just he, he was so influential, wasn't it? Everyone wanted to be him. He he was different. He was he 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 didn't take it too seriously. I think that's what he I was liked. doing new tricks. Yeah, I, I like the fact that he was really good, and he would joke about it so much. Like he would. Di- like you'd watch him do something you would thought was like really hard and he would like land on his seat on purpose or do something and like and you'd be like, This guy's sick. Like he's always laughing, always smiling, always high five with mates. I just thought Yeah. Yeah, I thought after watching that that I was like Robin Fenn is the best. It's so funny because he's one of my best friends and so often I'm hanging around with you and I and you remind me of Robin so much in so many little ways. It's it's so funny. One of the biggest compliments you've ever paid me that. What about okay? Who so he's your one of your favorite riders? Who's the best rider? God damn, you're putting me on the spot here. I mean, who do I really like to watch? I like to watch Sean McKenney. I know I'm like, there's nothing I can do to fathom what he does, but I really like watching him ride. I like watching Dak ride. Who else do I like watching ride? Um, what I would, what I do do if I want to, what I do do do. If I if I go around and I watch old videos, like I really rate watching Randy Taylor, rest in peace. He was the absolute don. He was so ahead of his time. And Matt Rowe, I would like Matt Rowe rides Matt Rowe. But I would I, if I go out riding, depending on what I want to ride. Like if I'm going out to like ride ledges or something, I'll watch a Randy Taylor video, or like an old one. Or if I'm going to go ride skate park in air quarters, I just want to watch Matt Rowe. And Matt Rowe is just he's a magician on a bike. He's literally, he he's literally a wizard. If you watch his new Instagram videos now on a mountain bike, he makes mountain biking look ridiculously stylish. And you're like, how have you taken your control from a bike this big to a control bike like that big and made it look like you haven't even done anything? It's ridiculous. He's always had that incredible natural ability. I went on a trip with him to Germany years ago and he's just, it's one of those trips where you come back just like reassess your whole life. Like, 
after seeing him ride, just like, what am I doing? I can't ever be like that. <laughs> you know, like, that's, that, that's the problem, right? I just want to get this point across. And what I try to tell anyone that gets into riding or any sport is, especially riding, never compare yourself to anyone else because it doesn't matter. Like if you start, once you start comparing your level to, to someone else's riding, you start to question your own ability and then you're not having fun. So then it affects your whole riding. But if you just go out there and accept that there's going to be people that are much better than you, there's going to be people more stylish than you, there's going to be people do more tricks than you, just concentrate on what you do, have fun, and accept that you're different. Your your riding is always going to be different to other people, and you'll enjoy it so much more. And I, I think it's also important that people should like just laugh and have fun. Like the like Robin Fenland. I'm going back to this. He like you would always see him laughing videos and having fun doing pranks. Matt Rowe, you will never see that man not smiling. Like he is the happiest man you will see. And I think it comes back to. Like, I think that's why I like them so much because they, in, you just look at them, you're like, they're enjoying this. This is like that. They're making this look so much fun and good that I want to be involved in it. I think. And that's what's interesting about you is you, whenever we've gone on any of our filming trips to film Tall Order videos, um, part of, for me, what's made them so successful, some of them, because what we've had like maybe what, five videos that have had millions of views, is I'm, I've, I'm out there with a bag of cameras. And I've br- driven a team to a spot. And in my head, it's, part of it is quite serious. I'm like, I've got a job to do. I need to get some good footage of these guys and I need to produce a good video. I've got, there's, there's worries. I've got a lot on my head, you know, like I'm trying to run a company, trying to start a company from absolutely zero and try and build it up. And then you always lighten the mood for me. And we had that kind of conversation, that dialogue back and forth, which just it always made it much more fun and because sometimes I can be a little bit serious and you'd always bring out the lighter side in me which would make me enjoy riding and you enjoy your ride and everyone else enjoy it and always remind me that yeah it's it's about having fun yeah because you 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 can go out there and be like yeah we gotta get I want to get a clip I want to get some good content but what I think resonates most with people in just in general life is if you're smiling it's infectious like if you're smiling having a good time if, no matter if someone's down around you, they're gonna they're gonna like they're gonna smile, and have a good time too. And I think it's mm. like positivity does breed positivity. If you're positive or just like okay, like it might be raining, we might like it might be like cold, but if we're here for fun, then because oh, always like going back, this is always the best sessions you ever have as a kid are when all your mates are having a laugh and like you're playing horse and it you could be doing like hard tricks, but you're all having a laugh. And I think progression just happens that way. I think the more fun you have in everything in life, the better stuff is because... Yeah, and that's the problem when when people start to... Oh, I've just got a little bit of cramp. Um, (laughs) That's that's the problem when, when you're riding and you start to, you know, it's so easy to get to the level where you you stop doing it for that essence which is just fun you start going no i don't want to do that trick because that's not cool that's not seen as being cool yeah. that, and it just that's that's when you need to you know reassess what you're doing 100 percent, i think i think back to riders this that's the thing about ride like when you talk about who's the best rider and stuff like that there's so many and my thing has always been mike aitken like he's oh. absolutely phenomenal and then I was thinking long and hard about this the other day, like who is the best rider in the world? And I, I really hate the word the best rider in the world because there's no such thing as there. Obviously, it's like subjective and all those kind of things come into it and lots of people are good at different things. But I was thinking if there had to be one person that is the defined as the best, it absolutely has to be Garrett Reynolds. Yeah, no, I, I think It has to be because he's been around a long time He's proved himself over a long time. He's still here. He has done everything. He he can ride ramps. He he can ride street. He can film video parts. He's a good professional. He's good with kids. He's good on social media. Like, you cannot fault him. He's been there and done it. He's he's not like the kid that's like really good at the moment who like, I wonder, I wonder how, how far he's going to go. You know, like someone like Courage Adams, like when's he going to, like Courage Adams is obviously incredible at the moment, but Garrett's 
he's he's you know he's 15 years deep he's still there he's still going he's still at the top of his game he, he's so good that i've literally you know like those nights when you're on youtube and you're going down the youtube rabbit hole and you start to think that your neighbor's an alien <laughs> I literally, if anyone, if there are aliens amongst us, I've literally wondered to myself, like, is, has Garrett got that? Like he, it doesn't make sense how good he is. It's ridiculous. Like, how can you be that good and that consistent? And the thing about his style is the way he rides, it almost has that, I'm not, not, it, it's not perfect. You know, like someone like Logan Martin is when they ride, it looks perfect there's a t- kind of tiny bit of rough around Garrett's edges, which makes it so enjoyable to watch. And it makes, it makes it think that you can do it. And now so many times I've seen him do like feeble to switch whip on the street and all these tricks. I'm like, I can do that. I can do that. I go out and I try and I'm like, Jesus Christ, that kid is, he's something else. Like Dennis Anderson is on that level. There aren't many people on that level, but Garrett he is consistently on that level and has been for the past 15 years. That is why Garrett Reynolds is the best rider in the world, in my opinion, if there were to be a best. I do agree with you because you, like, you can literally go and watch whenever Jutor, I can't remember how long ago Jutor was, but he was riding Jutor Park doing like 540-dollar bar spins, like three up seven boxes, truck to table boxes. He was winning Jutor and he'll come out and he'll ride street and he will hammer like the gnarliest, like remember his props by where he just blew everything out of the water and everyone was like oh my god so you like and this is why he's the best but you, i think you forget about how good garrett is because he is so good and it's like it doesn't even become a challenge to him to be good like you well that's the thing that's the thing like you like someone like ryan nyquist yeah he's obviously really good at what he does but he's he's he does tricks that no one else really does. Like he does like rocket bar spins and, and loads of bar spin tricks. So he's kind of found a niche yeah, so that, that no one really goes near and that's how he's able to stand out. But Garrett really is doing the hardest tricks that everyone is trying, you know, that everyone wants to be able to do. He's literally the best. It, does, it, it, it doesn't make sense how good he is. Oh no, I totally agree. And like you said, he, he can ride park as good if not better than everyone else it's it's insane but then you said you're watching do a, uh, a feeble switch but i've seen i've seen you do a feeble to switch whip yeah that's the thing i could probably manage a feeble to, feeble to switch whip but he he will manage it like he, he can do it whenever he wants and like i'll tell you when i was very deeply scarred by garrett and i've been scarred by him a few times um <laughs> We were in LA for X Games in 2012. And funny enough, I was invited to the X Games and I didn't drink for like two months leading up to it. I was training. I was like, <laughs> I want to I wanna be able to get in the bowl and, and not run out of steam, you know? So I was like, I was all hyped. I was taking it seriously, doing some exercises every day. And like, I was out in Austin, Texas at the time, like riding up hills in the heat. And I was like, this is fun, you know, preparing for something, having a goal. Anyway, we get to X Games. Red Bull throw this huge party on the Thursday night. My event was on the Saturday. I was like, this party was so ridiculous. I couldn't <laughs> help get involved. And next thing you know, I'm absolutely wasted. Three in the morning in Garrett Reynolds' room. He had this massive Red Bull suite, this huge room. It was the, it was the weekend he signed for Red Bull. There was loads of people in there. It was amazing. His event was on the Friday. This was Thursday night. And I was just like, Garrett, this is the weekend you're signing for Red Bull. This is a big weekend for you it was we, we were drinking vodka ollie at four in the morning it was like <laughs> it, so anyway wake up next day i am steaming i felt i couldn't have felt any worse i was like there's no way garrett's riding today no way there's no way a human could ride a bike today because there's no way i could i pulled my sunglasses <laughs> i went down i was surprised to see him downstairs at breakfast he was looking rough i was like you're right he's like no he's like <laughs> So he's like, I think he tried, it was it was a hop three, I'm almost positive, it might have been a hop truck though, probably a hop truck now in Garrett. He tried a hop truck and he crashed and I was like, dude, you, like, what are you going to do? You need an excuse, like, you need to, you, you can't ride this event. Anyway, we, so we get to the, the street event, it's blistering sunshine, yeah, like the hot LA summer morning. And I'm just like sitting up in the shaded athlete area, like drinking like cold water, like 
eating watermelon, you know, just trying to make myself feel feel better. I looked down at the street course, Garrett's practicing. It's like nine or 10 in the morning, you know? And I was like, oh. how? I felt so sorry for him. Anyway, they call his name out for the contest. He rolls in. He is shocked. He crashes his first run. He's all over the place. I was like, poor Garrett. This is the weekend <laughs> he signed for Red Bull. Chad Curley drops in, drops this incredible run, sitting in first place. I was like, Garrett, like, I just felt bad for him because he'd won so many comps previous. Yeah. Call out his name for his second run. At this point, I'm sweating. I feel terrible. <laughs> he rolls in, dude, and that is it. He, he, once he's pulled his first two or three tricks, it's like something just goes off inside of him. It's like, and he just turned it on and he pulled everything. He did the most amazing 60 second run. And it was like, you could tell it edged, uh, chad just slightly out you know and then the funny thing is garrett collapses he literally collapses on the floor under this this one part of the shade they had on the course there's cameras in his face and he's just dying on the floor right <laughs> and then they, then they announce he's won gold you know most x games athletes when they win gold they're on shoulders running around you know he he's literally dying on the floor <laughs> hanging out of his bottom yeah. i was like no one really kn knows out there how how bad he was feeling that day other than the people that were with him that night and so i was just after that day i mean i've always been scarred by him but i was just that's incredible that, that's also and that's the thing about garrett he's the nicest dude and i know it's such a cliche to say nice he's really good but he's really nice too he is yeah. the most solid dude in bmx so he wins it for me i mean after, that's it and like, that's all i always thought he's good but like after that story i just he's up there he wins <laughs> I like changed your, your opinion. I, I love hear like I love stories like that when you hear about and you're like this is incredible how this person's dealt with it. Like I just if, that was a true true athlete. You'd appreciate that because you love um, athletes rising to the top and like you're all interested in people doing ultra marathons and stuff. Yeah. This was an endurance feat of the gods. That is literally you imagine like I can barely even get off the floor when I'm hungover, let alone ride my bike. I think I've ridden. Ridden my bike a few times, hung over, just like crashed doing a Smith grind, and been like, "Yeah, I'm going home. This is too much." <laughs> so I love yeah, that stuff. Yeah, I, I don't know how he did it, um, but yeah, incredible. But maybe we can get Robin Fenlon and Garrett to have a little game of bike one one day and see who's the real best. <laughs> Do you know how much that that would please me to see that? Do you remember what was it? BMX Pig on Extreme Sports. They did, yeah, that was sick. I remember the kids who watched that. That was sick. I went to, um, where did I go? S Malaysia or somewhere like that. I can't remember now. Why? Singapore for for like a game of pig once. And uh, I ruptured my spleen within 10 minutes of riding on the course. It was fun. I was laying on the course, <laughs> dying. Literally, I was like, what's wrong with me? I couldn't even like ask for help. Daniel Dare stopped and was like, you okay, man? I was like, Ugh. and then the next thing you know, they, they took my blood pressure and seen that it dropped because I'm bleeding internally. That was it. I was rushed to hospital and I was in the hospital, this sketchy hospital dude, like it was stunk, you know, it's like hot, there's flies. I was in the hallway, like, <laughs> is this it? You know, like this is, this is the glamour of professional BMX. And they were like asking if I had insurance, you know, they were basically asking for a credit card before they would treat me. Yeah, well, I was like, this is gnarly. Wow. That, that's when you appreciate living in the UK with it, with our free healthcare system. When you're laying in, in, on the floor in another country dying, and they won't treat you Mate, until you get your cash mind. out. It blows my mind how, how people are like, even when they're like, oh, I can't get an appointment, or I can't. I'm like, I'm like, yeah, but it's free. I'm like, you are aware it is. It costs you nothing to get to get healthcare. And people are like, oh, but I've got to wait ages of physio. I was like, physio is thirty five pounds an hour. Get private, like, help someone else out. Oh, but it's like. I don't, I don't understand if you if you're if you're too worried about waiting go private but if not like expect to wait it's free so like, yeah dude like we have the best healthcare. like i when i lived in america i met you know it's like supposed to supposedly the land of the free and it's the place to live and very quickly i was like this is pretty scary living here like i was at the skate park one day in austin some kid broke his arm in front of me and he's laying there and he was i think he was like semi-unconscious too he's bleeding and we were like calling the ambulance he's like don't call the ambulance he like woke up so like, don't don't call it 
yeah i'm sorry i'm trying to remember it but yeah he didn't want us to call the ambulance he was like freaking out because he would have to pay 10 grand or whatever it was for the ambulance to show up i was like dude the amount of times i've been to the hospital in the uk with broken ankles and wrists and all sorts so like, no. but i think yeah because i when i was younger i smashed my hip out and i've got a titanium rod through my femur up into my hip and like you think how much Damn. you think how and I and I had physio through the NHS. You think how much that would have cost? I I got X rayed like three or four times. I had a bed over two nights. I had an operation. I got a titanium rod in me. Like I'd probably be in like hundred a thousand dollars worth of debt. And I think it's really hard for US pro pro riders because not only is it hard to get insured because they're doing a high risk sport. I think once they once they can get insurance, it's crazy money. It's probably like a thousand dollars a month. Imagine paying that. Yeah, just in case you break your finger. Like no, I think I've broken a wrist and a hip all, all my whole life. But imagine, yeah, you'd be paying like thirty grand, thirty grand for like three years of insurance. It's ridiculous. It makes you appreciate um, the level the US guys are at. The fact that they're doing that with, with oh, yeah. no healthcare. Like we know that if we crash at the skate park, that ambulance is going to show up. It's going to take us to hospital. Take us to hospital. And it's going to be free. Yeah. Like, like you know, times I've split my chin open and whatever, I've just been like sat in A and E, being like, "Oh, do you remember when I, my face exploded?" When yeah, yeah, take me to A and E. Oh my god, <laughs> that was amazing! <laughs> it was the day that you'd just you you'd not been with your girlfriend very long, and you're all excited. You Facetime, and she'd been on holiday. You were so excited for her to get back. You wake up in the morning, you look like the elephant man, didn't you? Your oh face my was... god! So p- p- put this into pers- pers- to put this into pers- perspective. <laughs> perspective for the for the uh, listener or the slash the viewer basically my girlfriend had been interrailing i hadn't seen her for like four weeks we were like in the honeymoon period like all loved up like i miss you i love you i'll come to see you and then like i got like bitten by like a mosquito in between my eyebrows at the skate park <laughs> and like they went like um then i think i had got bit and then went to work the next day and it was like all puffy and a bit swollen and i was like oh Feels a bit weird. So Jane, the account with this lady, was like, "Oh, you need to go hot. Like, you need to go and get that checked out. It looks a bit weird." So she sent me home, and the guy just gave me some antihistamines at the at the um the NHS place, or whatever it was. And I was like, "Oh, it's fine. It'll go down." And then I went home, and I was laying on our sofa with like a a cold flannel on my forehead. And it was like pretty swollen, wasn't it? And then so my girlfriend was getting back the next day, and I was meant to go with her brother to pick her up from the airport as a surprise. I've got the day off work and everything. And then like, I've woken up the next day and I literally, my face is it literally looked like the elephant man. Like, my eyes are swollen, like everything. I just look like I've got a balloon and gone off my forehead. So I'm like, I'm like I, yes, Ollie, you look really fit, mate. She's going to love you looking like that. So I've like, I've like knocked on Baz's door like, Bruv. And you're like, what? And I'm like, you need to take me to the hospital. And I remember it was like super hot. It was like 35 degrees or something stupid. And you've taken me to the hospital and I've walked into A&E and the woman who's like she's like typing on like accident emergency she's like um she like looks up at me and goes oh my god and she goes we'll get you seen right away and i was like brilliant i must have absolutely cooked so then i get i've got rushed straight in i think i waited two minutes and i'm sat on the hospital bed and then curtains drawn all of a sudden like 13 student doctors and like two normal doctors have come in and they're like poking my face and having like a lesson about cellulitis and deep tissue infection on my face and then um, I get pushed into, like, a cupboard or something. I'd have no idea. I had, like, a saline drip in. And I was there for, like, four hours. I had no phone signal, so I couldn't even phone my girlfriend to say, like, I'm not coming to get you or, like, why I haven't. And apparently she was, like, on the beach getting drunk because she was livid that I hadn't phoned or anything. So I was, like, phoned her, but, babe, I have a hospital. And then she's come rushing down. She's like, oh, I thought you were just, like, ignoring me. And I was like, no. And basically, yeah, that's the story of me when my face exploded and was swollen. Sick story. We did tell it earlier, so you kind of waffled on a bit there, but never mind. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. Cool. <laughs> He's had enough of me already. Um, so um, who, for example, like, you live at home, so you've got got it pretty good. Like, I was in the supermarket yesterday, and uh, <laughs> the checkout girl was like, you're in here all the time. I was like, what? I'm just trying to get some Corona. It was so annoying because I was like trying to go to the supermarket less and less, you know, she's like, ah, how come you're here all the time? I just, I just love food. Soz. Have you, have you been in the supermarket? They've got like one way systems in there. I, I, it's I, all like... I, went, I went early on when it first, first kicked off and it was a bit gnarly, but I haven't, I literally haven't left the house apart from to like run cycle. Like I haven't socialized, like not socialized, but I haven't like, 
been into town or anything for did your mum do all the shopping then yeah well, yeah my sister is a manager at sainsbury's and my sister my mum does the shopping with like as well so i haven't got to do shopping it's pretty good i pretty much just get food made for me and i just train all the time mate you cannot complain can you? i honestly can't like it's not a bad life i'm getting paid 80 percent of my wages to work out <laughs> i'm basically a professional you- athlete <laughs> yeah you are for the time being you need to not be too bummed if it's a, if it all ends soon and you're back to work no i'm not uh, yeah i probably will be bummed i'll probably just quit my job you should see the supermarkets though they're like one-way systems if you're, if you're like gnarly. you just you queue up and you're like social distance so you're like two me- meters apart from everyone then you when you walk in they wash your hands wash your trolley which i like i think that's pretty cool and then you walk around the one-way system. You feel terrible if you go out the, the the road the wrong way. You feel like you're going to get lynched for it. And then people look at you as though you've just committed a crime, which, you know, right? Okay. You're just, try, I, you're just trying to get your, sh- your eggs. I understand this whole, like, social distancing and all this kind of, like, don't touch me, this kind of stuff. But, like, if the problem the problem I, can, I can't deal with was when it first happened, it was like one day it was fine to hug your mates and then... As soon as Boris had said something on the news, everyone was like, "Don't touch me! Don't look at me!" And I, f- I find that like that kind of concept of it mental, because it was like, you know, you know, yesterday you were necking me, and today you can't look at me. Do you know what I mean? I, I, yeah, there's been lots of mistakes, and I, I went into the Tesco's early on with a mask on and a black ski mask over the mask because I was kind of shy about wearing like a white mask, mm. and this kind of this dude this. He just comes up to me and he's like, he works in Tesco and he just said, you're giving the security anxiety. I had a trolley full of nappies, toilet roll and canned goods. And I said, how anxious are they? Like, I'm, I'm going to run out of here with, with these nappies. I'm, yeah. There's a global pandemic and I'm wearing a mask for the safety of others and myself. I'm not trying to steal the eggs out of Tesco right now. Yeah, it, You get you get some jobs worth like that though, don't you? You're like, wow. Yeah. I'm just, I was just a bit shocked at that. But yeah, no, I haven't really left the house. More like, I'm pretty just chilling. Like, I go for like a walk in the forest, take some photos. That's about it. I think it's important. I think it's, you're doing the right thing. I, I made a video <laughs> on the YouTube channel the other day. And the idea I had was to just go out and ride around and film it with, you know, uh, an onboard camera. So I'm not getting off and stopping. Um, I had the camera bag on my back and I ended up take it, just stopping at a couple of spots. They were quite, quite secluded, but I set the camera up on tripod and shot a couple of different angles. And then when I was editing that and I put it together, I felt, I suddenly felt really bad because in theory, I, I was breaking the rules. Mm. Like you should, and I agree, like I, I almost deleted the video, I almost didn't put it out because the rules are stay at home unless you need to go out for exercise. I was out filming. Yeah. And, it, I th- and then the thing that, got me around that initially was I was just going to wear a GoPro on my chest. But then when once I stopped and I started filming from a tripod, it's different. And I did break the rules and, and, I, and I kind of apologize to anyone that noticed that because I do agree. And we shouldn't, I've, I've purposely not gone to skate parks. And you, you know, some people are going to skate parks and saying, oh, you know, there's no one here. It's fine. I'm, I'm distant. It's like, that's not the point. Yeah, no, you are at a skate park. And if everyone went to the skate park, there'd be a crowd at the skate park. And this sucks for everyone, but the quicker that we all, um, you know, abide by the regulations or whatever, this it will all be over. Oh, I totally agree. Like, you think I want to be training by myself at home? No, like I want to be at the gym with all the, all the boys having a good time, music blaring. Like, yeah, I could be like, oh, there's only four of us training. Like, there's only four of us, but it's the same as going to a skate park. Do you know what I mean? It's like you can't, you like you can't do it. You just have to be like, right, okay, this is how it is for three weeks. It might get relaxed, it might not. We just have to deal with it. I think people forget that this is actually a very serious thing. I think because it's not happened properly in our lifetime, like an actual global pandemic. Like it's not like SARS. Like SARS wasn't massive, but like it's not like uh, sw- like not swine flu. What was it? It's the Spanish flu. Like we haven't had an actual in our generation had a massive problem where life has had to change. I think people just forget that this is actually happening. People are dying, and you need to just be like, right, I need to not be an idiot. Yeah, totally. Like people are just, 
Yeah, yeah, I just don't think they, they believe it. And I think it almost comes around to the fact that there's no trust in the government and all that kind of stuff. There's no trust in the media. And so that that sort of mistrust in the government and the media has made people think that this is a lie. And it's like, oh, God, it's, it has to be some sort of point where you're going to just believe what you see, you know? Like, yeah. It's, I, I, it's sort of, it's sort of pe- like people that say the earth is flat. It's like, it's not flat. <laughs> You have to believe in science at some point. Yeah. No, I like. I definitely try not to watch the news too much, or because I think it's very. That's a good tip for anxiety. Yeah. I I stopped watching the news. I think I just I just think in general the news is there to make you feel slightly depressed. Then you never really have any good news, and if it's super important, you'll find out. But I yeah I just I just don't really get involved with the news because unless it's the weather, I'm not bothered because. Yeah. I want to know what the wind's like tomorrow, not if there's something going to happen badly. I agree. Um, so one thing that I'm going to try and do this week is I've got lots of work to do as far as the business goes. We've just got a massive order of tool order parts. In fact, you need to email me a list of new parts for your new bike if you want one. Um, I so I'm going to be sent. <laughs> no, you don't deserve one, but you never have. <laughs> 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 no, I'm just kidding. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm going to try and make a video for the Tool Order YouTube channel this week. Maybe another garden video. Of, it's so hard because I've got to try and be think of something that you know you inspires do? people. I think you should ride down your stairs on your bike. Listen, man, I, I with the first video I did in my garden doing tricks on that little ramp, I I thought, yeah, it'd be, it'd be fun. Alice will be there and Wilson, but you know you you forget that they don't ride they're, they're not they don't they're not as key they're not it's not like being at a skate park where they're going to cheer me on they're, they're doing painting and they're in my way and i'm like get out of the way and, I'm, and then i realize that i'm not at a skate park i'm at home Alice is stoked. you're just on a bath been off the kick and you're like do you realize how hard this is and like, i don't care you're like, yeah, but it's hard uh, she's like don't crash into my geraniums you know <laughs> it's like, so yeah i'm going to try and do another video this week to um promote being at home and I, I I like the idea of of like little workouts or exercises you can do with your bike or um, stuff like that. You know, I Ollie also for you, those of you listening did a what was it like five exercises that anyone can do at home that help your core and your core is the is the is sort of the the main muscles you need for riding. Oh, you need, you, yeah, I did a little video for um, on the Tool or Crew page, just like stuff you can do at home that's going to keep you like mobile and like help strengthen your core and stuff like that, like push ups, just stuff like that. If you if you appreciate it, let me know. But um, that's it's the thing in BMX. It's it's this strange, it's a strange attitude where it, uh, maybe it's me imagining it and it doesn't actually exist, but. It feels like there's the narrative is that you could, if you're a BMX, you only ride BMX and you don't really need to um, do fitness or, or work out or, you know, any, any kind of stuff like that. But I think if you, if you're, this can only help your riding, especially at a time when you're not riding that much. If you're a, a younger rider and you're up and coming, working out your core is going to help you so much when you come back to it. Oh, I totally agree. I think, I think more now though, there's like, no, no one shows it, but you like you got the top the top end like comp pros all train and like eat good. Yeah. But like, they don't ever show like they're working out or what they're doing. And so, so yeah. it's, still, it's still a bit hush hush. Like it's fine. You go to the gym. It's fine. You throw a barbell around. It's fine. It's fun. Like the gym isn't boring. Like it's not weird. It's not like everyone like look at my muscles. It's like I personally like I take in, I do CrossFit and I'm a CrossFit coach, so I do like a completely different like aspect of training compared to bodybuilding like it's more high intensity like more gymnastic based more like movement and strength based so it's not like i'm just doing a shoulder press it's like functional movements for you so i i'm i favor that training but i think i think if people just opened up and be like yeah i do actually train like I, as well as i eat good like cause I, I i like how it's become in bmx it's cooler now to like actually drink water and actually like eat well and look after mm. yourself like people aren't like slamming burgers and being like it's cool like <laughs> well some some people yeah, are <laughs> some people are, but, I, 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 but that's what I, i'm really hoping that you give us a round two of your of workouts that help you ride like will you do that for us soon yeah I'll, i will i will film a video i will do that for you for the gang i think i think it has to be super like easy for people that are literally starting from the from the bottom you know yeah. like you're you're very advanced in 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 exercise and stuff like that because you've 
you've been doing it a long time you've been actually studying it and stuff like that but i think if you break it down for for someone that's new to it a younger bmx and you say okay here's five um body weight exercises you can do at home it will take you 30 minutes this is going to help you your core and give you a six pack and help with your riding i'll whip up a video for you you did that you did that last time but i think just even if it's the same kind of the one even i tell you what i really like like to do and we were going to do this together before the whole lockdown is we were going to try and film a video about how easy it is to start running it's literally put on some running shoes and leave the house yeah. it's literally then you're running it's that simple and make sure you drink loads of water because hydration is key i need to drink more water i drink a lot of tea I try and drink three litres a day at the moment because I've got time to watch how I drink. So that's always good. Cool. So what's your goals and plans for for post-lockdown? Post-lockdown, I want to hopefully take on some more running clients or um, endurance-based athletes for my coaching. Um, basically, I just want to try and, in, like, post-lockdown, just enjoy being with people, just enjoy hanging out. Like, too many times in the recent months, I've been like, oh, no, like, I'm not going to go hang out. I'm going to go because I, I want to get up early and train. Like, I'm not going to go this because I want to go train. And I've, like, I've not socialised. And I've kind of feel like I, it's put into perspective, put this into perspective how much I want to hang out with my mates and hang out and hang out mm. with people and just even just, like, have face-to-face -face interaction with people. Because I think as human beings, we thrive off being around people. So I had this I had this conversation with Jordan the other day and uh I think it's because he's going through a breakup at the time where he's really sort of becoming conscious of, of like his own self-awareness and he was saying to me that he's been selfish in his life it's all he's ever focused on is riding and it's paramount it's it's, it's more important than his mum it's more important than his friends and family it's like I, I want to ride and work to make money to ride and, and then and he said to me the other day he's like I had a realization that my friends, his his friends that are, you know, um, builders and the girls he hangs out with, they don't love riding like he does. It's not important to them. So like he said no to so many occasions where they've invited him to do things. And he's like, I need to realize that I love riding. Doesn't mean everyone else does. I can do it, but I still can't. It's not the sole thing I need to do in my life. I need to make time for my friends, my family. And they are as important, if not more important, than your selfish desires to have fun on your bike. And I, I, I've done the same thing by having a baby. It's like, um, I, riding's always been the most important thing to me. But it's like, when you have a kid, it's the ultimate letting go of the ego where you suddenly realize that you are not the most important thing in the world. And, it, and it's, it's a good feeling because your ego drops and you suddenly you're taking care of someone else more. And I think I think it's good, a good time right now for people to to work out and stuff like that but i think it's going to make us realize the freedoms of being able to see friends and stuff um, and family are very important too i well, who was i was saying something to my friend the other day we were facetiming i was like i was like nothing's going to ever compare to um what what was the year that, was it 2018 was the world cup yeah. and i was like i was like nothing will compare to the summer of 2018 like that summer for me was the epitome of like socializing i think I had I had just moved back to Ringwood and I hadn't really seen anyone. I was kinda of like in my own bubble. And I met my friend Sam, who like we're back like we're best back being like being best mates again. We used to ride together. And I met him and I, I was riding to the gym and he was just like cycling and we met on like there's a disused railway. It's like a footpath now. We met there and he was like, Oh, do you wanna come watch the football game with me after after you go to the gym? And I was like, Yeah, yeah, sure. So I've gone trained and I didn't have time to go home and change. And just gone out and just like met him for a beer and watched the game and then like we became friends again and the whole summer was just like i remember everyone was just so happy and it, i feel like yeah it's like a collective feeling of happiness when there's a, a big um in, like a big football tournament or sporting event and everyone gets behind it together and, and I, do you think that's that's similar to how it is now i then? feel like i feel like everyone's kind of like yeah i feel like even though it's not as happy there's not as much happiness and everyone's like all like hugging and i think everyone's kind of there for each other now like like I'll text people like, yeah, you're good. Or like, if so, I see something on yeah, Instagram, yeah, someone's right. like, I feel like someone's like not up. Like I'm like, I'll text them be like, yo, you okay? And like, I feel like everyone's kind of checking yeah. in on people because everyone yeah. knows how tough it is. There's more, there's like a more collective thought of like making sure people are okay in this time. And I appreciate that because not enough people check on other people if they're okay. 
Because it's so, it's yeah, so I, easy I think to, to, not to just kind of be like, oh, they're fine. They're happy. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, maybe, maybe culture, society and individuals have been so focused on their own individual goals and businesses constantly expand and then suddenly you would check, we got like a check yourself moment with this thing that puts everything to a stop and it's like, wait, we've all been selfish here. We're selfish to the planet. Like, you know, the ec- ecology is getting worse and worse and it's maybe it's a time for us all to be like, the more important things are friends, family, being there for one another, all that kind of stuff. I think it, it, this is definitely put into, pers- into perspective just how important certain things are. Like, your, what is important is your friends and your family. Like, your relationships you have with other people are more important than, like, anything else. And that's what we thrive totally. as a human being. So, so I think we're coming away from the material world and being more like, oh, we actually have wealth in, like, emotions and actually, like, understanding each other rather than being like, I want a new pair of Yeezys. But that's the thing with social media. It's really pushing the individualism agenda where everyone's individuals and they're focused on their own individual goals and nothing but that. And it's like, like for example, Orientals, people in Asia are much more crowd-based. That They do things for their community. Mm. and But in the West, it's much more like, me, 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 iPhone, I, I, me, 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 I, I do this, my social media. And it's like getting worse and worse and worse with all the new, new, um, you know, TikTok and Facebook and Instagram and constantly chasing likes. And it's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. It's not all about individual. It's about your group, your family group. Mm. That That's what it used to be like, is like take care of your friends and your group and your family group. It's not you know, families are so broken now. It's like people in different rooms watching their different their different TVs, their laptops, yeah. and they're not all together anymore. It's like they're focused on the self. And I think this this has taught people not to be all about the self. We got to think about each other. I I agree, and I think that's a great. I think it's just great. <laughs> I think it's awesome. I really do because, like, I I know I say like I sometimes I want to be alone, but like I'm. A social person i enjoy bouncing around and like having banter with people like i thrive off interaction and i think i think a lot of people are going to realize that interaction is the most important thing like not like yeah. not like likes or whatever but actually interacting face to face because people don't people yeah. don't know how to talk to people anymore you notice that with yeah. you notice that with like kids at the skate park they don't know how to talk to a human being no it's sad it's really sad i worry about that for my son and yeah, I just think we need, all need to check ourselves and, um, yeah. I agree, mate. <laughs> I agree. Um, I forgot what I was going to say now. Uh, have you got anything to say, Ollie? Because I literally have gone, my mind's gone blank on a subject oh, I was about to talk to about. But we should probably wrap this up in a minute anyway. We're at one hour, 21 minutes. Oof, that's, a naughty, that's a naughty little time limit. Oh, that's what I was going to say. You know me. I do not function at night time. I was listening to another podcast the other day. Someone was saying like my, my ultimate um, time for optimization, like I operate the best is between six and 12 midday. I, I get home. And, and the thing is, my girlfriend's the opposite. Like she functions at nighttime, but by like eight, Eight o'clock, nine thirty. I've done so much in the daytime. I'm nodding off. You know, oh, like, I, you're the same I a little bit, aren't like, you? I am up at five o'clock, eating. Tr- I train by six, get stuff done, like, and then I, I go to work for like eleven forty-five. So I have my day in the morning. Yeah. So I'm I'm used to functioning and like processing everything I have to do between six and twelve, and then yeah, I I just don't bother after twelve o'clock. I feel like it's night time now. Like, yeah you just don't work after, yeah. after, that's cool after, though that's a good midday, that's, that's a like, nice hour yeah, midday is like the end for me because i don't know i th- I feel like i'm more productive always in the mornings because i feel i feel like you f- you kind of have this mentality where you're the only one up and you're the only one working so it's more motivating that you're the only one doing something for me i just have the most energy when i first wake up in the morning i don't know i'm just recharged i feel most creative when i'm first thing in the morning me too and i and i've I find that if I don't look at my phone in the morning, I'm much that sort of boredom you have for just waking up and your mind's active. I'll start sort of going over in my head what I want to do. If I start being distracted by like my phone, then I'm in the phone and on emails and not thinking fresh new ideas and stuff like that. What I found 
what I found good is I keep a notepad by my uh, like a like a notebook by my bed, like a little leather bound book. And when I wake up, I write down like my schedule for the day. So like if I wake up at seven, I'll be like, right, I'm gonna I'll write down training at eight till nine, and then I'll have like I'll write down a little schedule, like maybe a loose one of what I'm gonna do through the day. But ha- I think having that helps me from slipping into just being like, oh, I'll watch TV and oh, I'll do that in a minute. I'll do that in a minute because I because yeah, I have a time definitely. I time limited my day. Like yeah. it's not it's not stu- it's not like stupid. I like, wake up and like learn French, do this, do that. It's just like like just to give me a basic structure. So because I I yeah. find no. I need structure in my days because I don't, I don't yeah. I don't function. Yeah, no, I agree. No, I I think we should leave it at that. Like I I write lists. It's all about lists, yeah. isn't it? And that's what my my friend said to me the other day. I was like, he's like in his forties. He's like, mate, lists. That's all you need in life. Change my life. <laughs> They all sort your life out. <laughs> Write a list every day. Um, but yeah, we're going to wrap it up now. We'll do this again sometime, Ollie. Maybe even once a week or whatever. Yeah, but we'll... Um, good fun. Good fun. Um, soon we'll be sitting in the same little zone doing it. We won't be doing it over doing FaceTime. Doing it the corporation dream factory. Yes, we will. Anyway, thank you to everyone watching and listening. And uh, we'll see you next time, Ollie. Peace out, my brother. Peace out, boy.